there were ambulances outside the apartment when I got here. I wasn't in agreement with the way you guys were dealing with mom's sickness. I don't know whether I'll become manic this morning. The illness, depression and mania, they're minefields. If you're fortunate, you walk around the mine. If you're unfortunate, you step on it. She had this charm and wit. She was like Joan Rivers. I feel so super. I feel super. Whoopee! She was a funky mother, and I love that about her. She was successful and powerful. She was a mucky muck. This was a dress of hers that I just dig. People wear this now. Yeah, when they go for sangria. Oh, God. I don't know if I can read this. We put her in New York psychiatric. You know, they were going to put her in a straitjacket. It was awful. And she did really bizarre things, dangerous things. It did not feel safe. <laughs> oh, dear. This is a bad moment. <laughs> the disease was intensifying and getting worse. Nobody stepped in to take command. Everything just conspired, uh, like a Greek tragedy, and just pointing inexorably towards that, that end. I think none of us know really why we are making the project we are making. So if you're collaborating with someone, how do you get a common language if you have no idea what you're making? So I worked with a woman um, on a film uh, about her mother's suicide. First started making it, like I said, she couldn't say the word suicide. And so my assumption was, Kathy needs to make this film so she can process the loss of her mother's suicide. So how did we, how did we begin to proceed? We began to proceed by talking about, you know, what do you want to film? What are the themes in this movie? What are you looking for? So uh, it turned out her mother had jumped out of the window of the apartment where Kathy now lives. And this is a, I think this is like a Hong Kong story also, because New York is so crazy with real estate. They had a really nice apartment. And even though her mother jumped out the window, the family doesn't want to give up the apartment, right? It's rent-controlled. <laughs> it's rent controlled. So it's this like crazy, terrible situation. Uh, and so she's living in this house. So, and there is the window that her mother has jumped out of. So I know, as a camera person, we're going to be filming in the apartment window is a visual theme, right? And also that courtyard down below is a thing. But I'm working with a director who can't speak the word suicide. So she can barely get near anything. She doesn't want me to film near the window. And in fact, it's an apartment that is a historic old building, and everything has had to be changed. But the family has never changed the window 
because literally no one can touch the window. It's like a memorial in this house that you can't touch. So I know I have to be very careful with this person because she can't say the word suicide. She doesn't want me to film the window. She doesn't want me to film in the house. We don't want to talk to the people who found her mother. Uh, you know, the, the list sort of goes on and on of all the things we can't do. Very strange, right? Why is this person making this film if they can't approach any of it? But this is often the case, right? That there's this real tension between what someone says they want to do and what they're able to do and what you're doing. Especially if someone is making a personal movie. Now, in some ways, what I contend is people are always making personal movies. It's just whether or not you know how to read the personal information in the movie. So the above that I showed you is an autobiographical movie, even though it's about the surveillance blimp <laughs> in Afghanistan. So with this situation with Kathy, we talk about what we want to do, and we go, and we talk about movies we're interested in. We talk about the way mental illness has been depicted in movies. We watch movies together. So we're building a vocabulary together. I'm learning about what's inside of her, what is inside of Kathy. I'm finding out that she loves Jacques Tati, right? Because I, I don't know that from looking at her. It's in, inside of her. So little by little in these kinds of conversations and in learning what the limits in the house are. So then I learn the house is full of the mother's stuff. You open a drawer, it's full of the mother's medications. And this is 10 years after the mother has committed suicide. So of course, I am filming the drawers full of medications. The mother has left little notes with handwriting all over the house. So I'm filming the handwriting. And then you open a closet, and there are notebooks. So we are opening the notebooks and filming the notebooks. But then Kathy is saying, no, I don't want to film the notebooks. So you take steps and take steps back, right? But you're starting to build this vocabulary together. You come across the word pain. And then you say, oh, I see pain here. I see pain there. And then you start to do close-ups of pain. But in that case, like, what was my ratio? I filmed hours and hours of this woman's notebook. And I read the words. I would go across. I searched in the word for clues. The more I got to know her, we revisited the notebooks, filmed them again. It was like my thinking was coming through in the filming. And in that kind of case, it's OK to overshoot. You're shooting with intention, right? But you're also trying to figure out, what is my intention? So here we go. We're working. And time is passing. Years are going by. She has one baby. She has another baby. And then the children are in the house. And the children are going near the window. And she knows she needs to change the window. And little by little, we film scenes. So finally, she gets to the place where they're going to repair the window. And I'm there to film on that day. And it's just extraordinary because they're ripping the window out of the building with like this violence. And then it's just a full drop, and it's open air. And Kathy is hiding in the kitchen because she can't stand it. And the guy who's repairing the window is just climbing outside of the window. And he has no idea what's gone on, right? And he's really comcomfortable being in this space. So suddenly I have this sort of incredible metaphor, emotional metaphor. And they take the plastic cloth to cover uh, the table and the furniture. But Kathy has gotten this beautiful bouquet of flowers that she has put on the windowsill that morning to commemorate her mother. And he takes the flowers, and he spreads this cloth, and it looks 
visually like a casket and like the draping of the... And because I am thinking about story and images, I'm suddenly filming what looks like this dead body in the middle of the room because it's a wide shot and you have this window that's wide open and it's like the whole story visually in one shot. And I can't have imagined this, but in my, you know, it's like a catalog of themes that you're running through in the moment as it's happening. And you realize, whoa, I have to get the wide shot where I see the whole length of the table because it is the body, right? No one told me, go film a wide shot now because you need a tight shot and a medium shot and a wide shot. It's because it has meaning and you're discovering the meaning and you're filming it with intention and compositional intention, right? So these are the things that are... But the remarkable thing with this story is we just keep filming and keep filming and I learn all these, keep learning all these things about the mother, but now it's three years, four years, five years, six years, seven years that we are making this film. And I maybe will shoot on it a week a year. And I'm a little bit like, when is this movie going to end? <laughs> right? And then one day we uh, are going, you know, there's lots of stuff in the house and we're taking it out and taking it out because I'm filming everything. All of the things she has been afraid to look at, because I need to film it, we're pulling it out. And when we are pulling something out, we find a box of tapes. And there is her mother's voice. And her mother has recorded hundreds of hours of things. And for a long time, Kathy was saying, I just have to throw out all this stuff. I just need to throw it out. But then she couldn't, because she couldn't let go of her mother. And then the only way she could save her mother was to have me film everything. So, you know, I was filming her clothes, the notebooks. Like, I had to film everything. But it was like an unearthing process she was going through. And then we found these tapes. And then it was like, oh my gosh, now she's got the movie, right? But no. <laughs> she listens to all the tapes. We keep filming. And really now I'm like, she has everything. Like, okay, she's learned all about the mental illness. She's learned all about the suicide. We have everything. So finally, we are, and all during this whole period, her brother has refused to be in the movie. And we all respect this. Her brother's never going to be in the movie. So they have like a country house up in the north part of New York, and everyone is visiting there, and they have more papers there. And Kathy's saying, we have to film more papers. And I'm like, ugh, talk about wanting to kill yourself, right? Like, I'm like, oh, I have to film more papers. I can't do it. But we're there, and her father and she are looking at love letters from the mother and the father. Very happy, beautiful scene between the two of them. They're talking. And all of a sudden, the brother walks into the room. And I don't move. I happen to be, so let's see, if you were, so we have to make the triangle. So here's the triangle. Nancy, you're here. You're Kathy. You're the father. And I'm, I'm here. Right? And because I've been filming them talking to each other. The brother comes over and sits here. And I know he doesn't want to be filmed, but he knows that we're filming in the room. And I am filming. And he comes in and sits down and starts looking at letters. So what do I do? Do I say, oh, do you want to be filmed? No. <laughs> right? He would say no, but he also knows what he is doing, right? He has come into the room where we were filming. Do I do this? No, right? 
we know this is a very fragile situation. And I know Kathy wants him to be filmed. So right now, I have a two shot, right? I can focus on Kathy. I can focus on the dad. Brothers over here. I want to be as inobtrusive as possible, right? So they're talking to each other, and I just, you see me moving? Do you hear me moving? I'm moving. I'm still moving. Oh, and if we say he, here he is, that's the brother. Suddenly I can see the brother. But the brother can still see me turning towards him. So I just go a little further back. Now I've got a three shot. Now I love cinema. I love a shot counter shot. Should I get up and go over here and shoot this while they're talking to each other? No. That scene will be over. So I commit. I'm like, I'm not going anywhere. And I can do this. And I can do that. And I can do that. And I can do that. In the most discreet way possible making no sound. And I'm also realizing something's happening. The brother is very angry. The scene I was filming was a love story, daughter talking, father, uh, and I can feel his anger. But he's also, it's like, Dangerous. I, I know if he sees me, he could throw me out of the room. So remember this thing of eye contact, right? I don't want him to see me seeing him. So I'm filming the father when he starts talking to the father. And then when the father is talking to him, I'm filming him but I'm looking over here, right? And my camera is sort of this way, so he can't really see that I'm. And starts this fight. I've been working on this film for eight years. <laughs> I know everything about this family. In this fight, I learn I know nothing about this family. I know nothing about what was happening. At the moment of the suicide, I certainly don't know. The father and the brother have never spoken about the suicide. And it's happening now in front of my camera. And I would say it is happening because of the camera. Right? It is also happening because of Kathy, who didn't know it. Of course she's making this film to deal with her mother's suicide. Of course she's doing it because there's too much shame about mental illness. Of course she's doing it because she wants to be an activist about changing people's ideas about mental illness. But without even knowing it, she is making the film because she wants her brother and her father to speak to each other again. And they have not spoken to each other in a decade in a real way. This is why we have been filming for nine years, right? She finished those other movies a long time ago, but this is what she needs to finish, right? And I mean, I'm not breathing, and I'm not alone. There's a sound person <laughs> in the room who is standing up, who is a very wise sound person, this wonderful woman named Judy Karp, and in the middle of this incredibly delicate situation, what happens? Outside, there's a snow blower. A man has come to blow the snow off the yard. And this is what always happens when you are making a movie. It is like the universe. This is the dark matter of the universe, right? So this family has hired the man with the snow blower. All we have to do is yell out the window and say, hey, turn it off. What happens if you do that? 
over. Judy is smart enough to know this is going to be lousy sound, but we've been waiting a decade for this fight. And I'm not going to interrupt it either. So this is a thing when we get trained to make technically perfect work, we think, oh, I have to get this kind of shots, or I have to have this kind of clean sound. But in fact, why are we making these things in the first place? Is we're trying to understand deep things. We're trying to, uh, Arthur Miller said this thing, the role of the artist is to discover what is hidden, right? We are trying to discover what is hidden. So it's happening. It's about to unhide itself, right? And we are compromised. But we are not completely compromised. We can get it. We can get the scene. And the sound will have this mm, sound underneath it. But who cares? Because we will have the scene, right? If this was an interview with an important person and you could stop and stop the sound without killing the interview, great. Do it. But in this case, no, <laughs> don't do it. And so, you know, this incredible moment happens between the father and the brother. And I filmed it in a way that it can be cut. I didn't just freeze and hold it in a three shot the entire time because I couldn't decide where to move, right? Because in, you would have no scene. You would have 40 minutes of people yelling at each other that you couldn't cut. You're still making a movie. And that's the challenge of like the past-present thing I talk about, right? You're in the present. If you make a false move, you destroy the present. But if you get so caught up in the moment that you freeze, you have no movie in the future. So you are inhabiting these two spaces simultaneously. And hopefully, you don't make a fatal mistake. like trying to cut the sound, right? So for me, this is the beauty of making films. It's like, you, I had no idea. I thought I knew I was wrong. And somehow we have this scene. And then Kathy finishes the movie very shortly afterwards. And the movie goes out into the world. And her and her father, the father and brother, are like speaking about the movie publicly. They Complete, completely shifts their relationship. So you say, do movies change the world? All we know, it changed us five people, right? But every time I go see this movie, there are people crying in the hallways. You know, like, it's a very difficult thing to talk about suicide, turns out. It took a long time for her to be able to speak it and then convert it into a way what she had inside could be shared on the outside. Where was she? She was right behind me. And she did not kneel down. But she did the same thing I did, which is just like slight. <laughs> just move it like she had a boom and just slight angling, right? Not. Right? And she's doing the same thing. She's working the compromise. I really want to get closer because the snowblower is going. But if I enter his peripheral vision in this moment, scene's over. So it's listening. And this is a great, for me, like, I think I shot the first five years as a camera person without listening to anything. Put on some headphones. Because listening is how you see. And we who love camera, we love composition, right? Like we're like, oh, it's like I'm framing all these beautiful shots. But I have no idea. Like the fight's going on over here. You got to hear it to be able to turn towards it. So and the other thing that's happening, cinema is layers, right? So it's image and sound and context. And everything doesn't have to say the same thing at the same time. So I'm filming. The two of you are talking. And 
you say something really harsh to her. I hear that. What do I want to see when I'm hearing that? I want to see how she reacts. Because I know I could see your contorted, angry face, right? But I hear your anger. What I don't know is, how does that affect her? All of these things can stack up. So if I'm seeing her shocked face as I hear this angry thing, I have a story. If I just see her angry face saying something, I have no story. Or I have a, less of a story, right? A less complex story.